From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 30, recorded on May 23rd, 2022. <music> Vincent Dracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from San Francisco, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? Well, summer hit on the weekend, and now it's back to spring here. It was so weird. Well, we we have had the same temperature here since uh, last June when I moved here, so (laughs) I have no idea what season it is. Yeah, periodically it's cloudy. Otherwise, it's (laughs) it's 55 to 65 and beautiful. It was 90, in the 90s over the weekend, oh. and now back it's back in the 70s. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent, everyone. Yeah, we, we're um, in my house. It snowed again this week, so we're also <laughs> going up and down. It was 80 degrees at one point. Um, I'm looking forward to the summer up there, though, because it's, it's usually about 10 or 15 degrees lo- uh, colder than the valley. Hmm. Also joining us from Vanderbilt in Nashville, Vivian Morrison. Hey guys, next next time we meet, it will be uh, Tulane. This is it New Orleans? Mm-hmm. Nice, very good. And from New York, Tim Chung. Hello, hi Vincent. Hi everyone. Yes, it's uh, it's boiling. It was boiling in New York City. Yeah, you you encountered that that heat this weekend, yes, right? Yes, I came yeah. back to the country just to be boiling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, weather notwithstanding, we are here to talk about uh, neuroscience because we're all indoors, actually. So the weather <laughs> doesn't really matter for us, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, without aircon, it wasn't fun. No, it's but, but you can get used to it. I was in yeah. uh, Zurich last week for a couple of days, right? Uh, hmm. no, there's nothing air conditioned as far as I could tell there. There's not. Uh, and it was fun. Uh, the hotel, beautiful old hotel. You open the window, no screens. I'm like, hey, what about the 80s Egypti? Oh, there aren't any. <laughs> yep, there are no bugs in Switzerland. No bugs. And you open the window and it gets cool. And it turned out that the building next to me, they were practicing piano at night. It was lovely. <laughs> no, no AC. Wherever you go. University. Uh, so... You can live without it, but it's not that hot over there. You can. Right? I mean, America, I mean, I think America over, goes overboard with AC. Yeah, we but you definitely need it on the East things. Coast. That's, <laughs> we, I mean, we have no air conditioning here, but that's because it doesn't get above 70 degrees. So it's so ridiculous need, in yeah. Even uh, the university buildings that don't have air? So it, I, they do not have robust air, I would say, because, okay. I mean, it's really never hot. And then there's just a couple days in the summer, but like by the time I feel like they would turn on anything that the that they might have it be yeah, cool yeah, again. Yeah. So I, I remember when I was an undergrad at uh, Cambridge University in in the UK, there's no air conditioning, and in the summer sometimes in the lab it would be too hot, so that the the rats would just stop uh, behaving. They would just refuse to do what they're supposed to do yeah. because it's just way <laughs> too hot, and like all those days it would just have to be written off. So maybe it's time for, for the UK to get some AC. Well, as you know, uh, Tim, here in New York, we have all these big glass buildings where the windows don't open. So even the smallest amount of sun overheats them. So they have to be air conditioned, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah, that's true. But of course, they, they make the air conditioning so ridiculously cold that you have to wear coats and jackets inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Now nuts. that we've complained about the weather and the <laughs> AC, now we can talk about science. And today, Tim is leading the way. All right. Okay. So today we are actually going to talk about uh, an infectious agent in the brain. Uh, well, proposed to be an infectious agent in the brain, which is a prion. Um, so today's paper is uh, something that is uh, close to uh, what our lab does. Um, which is Parkinson's disease. So uh, the title of the paper uh, published in Neuron is Transneuronal Propagation of Pathologic Alpha-Synuclein from the Gut to the Brain Models Parkinson's Disease. So that's a very long title, but let me quickly uh, go through the author list. And there are, let's see, two. Uh, There are two first author, 
Sang Jun Kim and Seung Hwan Kwon, and I think two co last author, which is uh, Ted Dawson and Han Suk Ko. Sorry about my pronunciation. Um, but I think these researchers are largely in uh, Johns Hopkins University um, in Baltimore. So yeah, so uh, Parkinson's disease is uh, the second, supposedly the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, the one of the most uh, well-known symptoms is uh, movement disorder, get movement deficit. So people with Parkinson's disease have uh, uh, very slow, have slowness of movement. So they either move very slowly or they don't move at all. And instead, they kind of um, uh, have this uh, very rigid muscles uh, often when they try to move. Um, and also sometimes it's accompanied by resting tremor. Um, so yeah, there are famous people who are uh, kind of uh, famous for well, famous people who are known to have Parkinson's disease. So, for example, Muhammad Ali um, later in life had Parkinson's disease, and also Michael J. Fox, who uh, uh, is, is also known as Marty McFly in Back to the Future. So, I'll just <laughs> uh, show that this is uh, you oh, know, nice. There oh. you go. It's an unofficial uh, party merchandise. But uh, Michael J. Fox has actually devoted his uh, course to helping Parkinson's disease research. So there's a Michael J. Fox Foundation that he started um, uh, for more research into the causes and also uh, of Parkinson's disease and how to treat it, how to prevent it. Um, now, Tim, does it, do you die of it or with it? You die with it. So uh, with a lot of neurodegenerative disease, um, why you die is not necessarily like very well. It's not like a heart attack. You, your heart stops and you have no oxygen and you die. But with neurodegenerative disease, you have less and less mobility. Um, your body start your, your overall body function start going down, and sometimes you don't move very much, and you start getting like increased pneumonia, infection, some some other. So you guys should correct me if I'm I, I think uh, mistaken. I think the answer is a lot of people die with it and men, and some people die of it. And the way that they kind of the end stage is like aspiration and swallowing dysfunction as well as just like nutrition, like having poor nutrition and that kind of stuff. So, and I think that that's like a common pathway of death and all in several neurodegenerative diseases. But it's also true that uh, Parkinson's not just movement, right? So mm -hmm. there are cognitive issues that develop or are manifest of their sleep and um, there's more, I think, cognitive um, symptoms than had sort of been thought initially, right? Yeah, and I think something like 50% of patients with Parkinson's will have dementia 10 years after their diagnosis. Right. And, and I, think that, I mean, this is another discussion at some point, but the, the diagnosis has always been based on pathology, which is some somewhat nebulous in that it, it's not as clean as... Uh, we had thought. So that's where the alpha synuclein comes in. But a lot of these neuro neurodegenerative disorders have uh, specific toxic proteins that are associated with them. But it, many times you can see multiple kinds of pathology in one brain. And so um, there's some overlap, I would say. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think one of the criteria for Parkinson's is that it is uh, treatable by replacing your brain of dopamine, um, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but the, uh, the most obvious, by far, the most obvious symptoms of Parkinson's disease is this uh, lack of movement or slowness of movement. So it's class usually classified as a movement disorder. Um, but increasingly, people have noticed that this movement disorder is preceded by years by other non-motor symptoms. So for instance, uh, uh, Parkinson's patients often notice that they suffer from uh, constipation. So there are some gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. And another famous uh, kind of, they call it prodromo, which is you know, uh, kind of early onset symptoms is the uh, lack of uh, inability to smell or reduce smell function. Um, and for a long time, people think that these uh, these kind of early symptoms 
should be explainable by something else. Like it might tell us about how the disease uh, is started. Um, but uh, when you look at the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease, one of the uh, one of the hallmark of the pathology is that you see these uh, inclusion, these little um, dots in neurons, and these dots are called Lewy body. That are these dots are pathological kind of inclusion uh, that are not seen in normal pa uh, normal humans, and um, they. People have kind of, you can do immunostaining against uh, a pan of proteins and ask the question, what are in these Lewy bodies? Um, and people found that they include this protein called alpha-synuclein. Uh, a lot of alpha-synuclein protein gets aggregated into these Lewy bodies. Um, and moreover, there's also a lot of ubiquitin in these Lewy bodies. And for cell biologists, ubiquitin is this protein tag that your cell makes that uh, your cells would put onto any protein it wants to degrade. And it's kind of like a little tag to tell a cell, please put this in the garbage disposal. And it would get taken to the lysosome where it's degraded, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, your neurons have these Lewy bodies that are full of alpha-synuclein and also ubiquitin um, led to researchers to propose that what, what is wrong with the neurons is that it is kind of suffering some, from some sort of disposed, like it couldn't get rid of its trash, its garbage. And therefore, all the alpha, as specifically, it's the alpha synuclein. Something happened to the alpha synuclein uh, such that it is now unable to be cleared by your, your garbage disposal in your neurons. So in a way, your, your neurons are kind of suffering from an indigestion of the alpha-synuclein. And, and that what is alpha-synuclein? Ah, okay. So uh, Vivian first. So alpha-synuclein, it's a protein that is... So it's a protein, and it is uh, made in neurons in... Uh, quite a bit of quantities, and the name synuclein, so alpha, the name alpha synuclein, alpha is because there's apparently three, one of three members in a family, alpha, beta, and gamma. And the protein synuclein tells you where it's normally found. It's normally found is in synapses, so the sign bit is from synapse. And it's also found in the nucleus, so the nu nucleon is because you can find it usually in the nucleus. Um, the normal function of alpha synuclein. So all of us we express these alpha synuclein in the neuron in our neurons. Um, the normal physiological function of alpha synuclein is debated. We actually don't know too well what it's for. Um, it is found to be associated with membranes, I think, and uh, it is involved in some sort of uh, release of synaptic vesicles for neurotransmitter release, for example. Um, and that's why it's enriched in the synapses. And inside the nucleus, I think people suggested it's got something to do with DNA repair, uh, which also makes sense in the neurons because you have to repair your DNA. You're not replicating in new. Once neurons have become neurons, they're postmitotic. They're not replicating anymore, so they have to keep their DNA in check. Um, but I think it's still quite debated what alpha synuclein, uh, like the actual role of alpha synuclein is. It's very abundant, though. It's like one percent of all protein at synapses is alpha synuclein. So it's oh. um, whatever it's doing. It's there's a lot of it. But and I would say its effects on neurotransmitter release are pretty well documented. How exactly oh. it does that, it's not clear. But it, but it is clear that I'd say there's alterations in neurotransmitter release. I think the big question, though, is why only some cells are uh, vulnerable, right? So you're probably going to get into which types of neurons are actually affected. Right, right. And, and I, one, I think, just to take a step back is that across all neurodegenerative diseases, even though they affect different parts of the brain, um, there are two key principles across their pathology that they share. So it's generally a misfolded or kind of buildup of 
of, uh, of protein. So in Parkinson's disease, it's alpha-synuclein, but in Alzheimer's disease, it's A beta and tau, and in progressive supranuclear palsy, it's tau, um, and in ALS, it's uh, TDP43 or other pathologies. Um, and then these seem to affect different populations of neurons for some reasons that I don't think anybody really understands um, that, that leads to the different phenotypes. And so that paradigm is the same across all these diseases. Uh, do you think, sidetracking here, but do you think neurons are especially vulnerable to um, kind of misfolded proteins? I mean, I think that in that they're post-mitotic, they become more vulnerable. You can imagine that if something is dividing, it can dilute out the garbage, right? Like the uh, solution to pollution is dilution. But the, whoa. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but if you're a neuron, you can't do that. Um, and, but if you, but if you, so in multiple system atrophy, which is kind of a PD, a Parkinson's, uh, adjacent disorder, um, there are alpha synuclein inclusions in glial cells. So it's not kind of always in neurons, but, but I think there's a lot of diseases where there are. Now, another issue with neurons is that they are as old as we are. And so, um, unlike dividing cells, of course, that replenish themselves, neurons are, um, old cells. And, and so one could think about evolution and we, we, we humans now surpass our expected lifespans by a lot. And so there's no real reason for um, uh, evolution to help with uh, clearing out these proteins from when you age. So really, in, in reality, all these neurodegenerative disorders are, are an aging um, so, uh, disease. That's the biggest risk factor is aging. And we, we can get back to, to, just to kind of bring us back to Parkinson's, I think the evidence for alpha synuclein being pathogenic in Parkinson's does come from uh, path pathology descriptions showing that Lewy bodies are made up of alpha synuclein. Um, but discovered before that actually was that there are families that have mutations in alpha synuclein. So either triplications of the gene or, um, or point mutations within the coding region that um, essentially increase their risk for developing Parkinson's disease. So it was a genetic identification. And then once they had identified the gene that was kind of causative in those families, they looked at sporadic Parkinson's disease and found the gene in Lewy bodies or found the protein in Lewy bodies, excuse me. Ah, oh, okay. Makes sense. Um, so uh, as Ori said, there was uh, some genetic link of alpha synuclein mutation to Parkinson's disease. But um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think over 90% of Parkinson's patients have no known genetic cause. So if, um, if a patient comes to a clinician and say, oh, I think I have Parkinson's disease, 90% um, of those patients don't actually have the mutations that, that is linked to uh, Parkinson's disease. So it is so there's some other trigger that causes Parkinson's disease in these patients, and we actually um, are only beginning to understand uh, what is it, what it is. Well, it's still highly debated, actually. From this paper, we we see that we're beginning to understand. Um, but one of the clue of how we uh, how Parkinson disease Parkinson's disease is initiated uh, comes from uh, anatomy study of post-mortem brains. So, um, uh, ah, before I say that, I should mention that the reason, one of the reasons why um, uh, Parkinson's patients have motor dysfunction and uh, are unable to move is because these uh, Lewy bodies and alpha-synuclein pathology um, attack, uh, seem to attack uh, this area in your brain called the midbrain. And inside this midbrain area has these, uh, there are these dopamine neurons. And dopamine is uh, famous for being very important for movement. Um, so once you lose these neurons, you are unable to move. Um, and the treatment for Parkinson's disease, at, le at least at the early stages, is by replacing your brain of these dopamine uh, by giving a drug called levodopa. Um, so, uh, but we don't. What we don't know is what causes these Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein aggregation in the midbrain dopamine neurons. Um, so, uh, one of the early clues is uh, work done by a German anatomist uh, called Brack, 
um, what he did was he looked at uh, many different post-mortem uh, brains of Parkinson's disease patients. Um, and somehow he had access to patients at different disease stages, so different disease severity. Um, so kind of, it's kind of like a timeline of progression of Parkinson's disease, and he could associate disease severity with where he saw these Lewy body pathology in the brain. And what he found was that uh, these Lewy body pathology and alpha synuclein you know, pathologi pathology is first detected um, in the, uh, an area in the medulla called the dorsomotor nucleus of the vagus. So this is one of the early region. And a second early region is at the olfactory bulb. So um, the uh, dorsomotor nucleus of the vagus, which I'm probably going to uh, call the DMV, uh, yep, uh, call the DMV, uh, well, it's, the, it's a part of the, uh, it's a nuclear structure that connects uh, from, that connects the brain via the vagus nerve uh, to your enteric nervous system and also to the rest of your body. So it's kind of like an information superhighway from your brain to the rest of your body. Um, and the olfactory bulb connects to your nose. Um, so what is interesting is that, uh, what is of interest is that these two regions are obviously the um, kind of the bit of your brain that is closest to the outside world because your nose is very close to the outside world uh, through your face. And your uh, your DMV is close to the outside world via the vagus to your stomach, and you ingest a lot of food. Um, so that's where the pathology is first found, and later on, it's at later stages of Parkinson, it gets spread to um, to the midbrain uh, where the dopamine neurons are, and then also to the rest of the brain. So it kind of spreads further and further more. And when it spreads to other areas of the brain, that's when other symptoms start showing up, such as dementia uh, that Ori mentioned earlier. Um, so because there's this progressive spread from, um, from these, uh, you know, the olfactory bulb and also the DMV in the medulla, uh, which is close to your spinal cord, and slowly spread up to the midbrain and then slowly spreading to the rest of the brain, it let um, Brack to propose that Parkinson's disease and this Lewy, uh, Lewy body pathology may have started from the nose or the gut and spread via neurons and the synaptic connection to the rest of the brain. Um, so, uh, which yeah, we, we and, uh, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, it's I, it's sort of interesting that that Brock was. I mean, this was ages ago, right? And so now we're only just revisiting that that sort of uh, spread idea. But what's interesting is that you'd think, um, uh, I th we're going to talk about the prion nature of this uh, alpha synuclein, um, but you would expect from uh, kind of uh, Matt, Matt Cow's disease and BSE um, that a lot of stuff can get triggered, a lot of neurological diseases can get triggered in the gut and spread to the brain. Because that's supposedly when you eat a beef burger that is contaminated, that's how it gets initiated. Um, but yeah, so now, so based on this, so Bragg proposed this, I think like maybe 20 years ago, but there's now been a snowballing um, attention paid to the possibility that uh, alpha synuclein pathology actually started from the gut. Um, so what are some of the evidence? So before we get into the paper, I'm going to quickly talk about um, some of the evidence that alpha synuclein can act like a prion. Um, probably should define what a prion is first. Prion uh, actually is a protein. So I probably should say alpha synuclein acts like prion-like protein. Um, prion itself is like a trademark protein. It actually is encoded by a gene. Um, and it's famous in that um, it is also expressed in all neurons. And if you eat a burger that is contaminated by Matt, Matt Cow's disease, then those uh, burgers contain a misfolded form of this prion protein. And this misfolded form of prion protein, if it ever comes into contact with another uh, prion protein, that is normal, non-misfolded. 
through some mechanism that I don't think is well known, it would trigger the normally folded proteins to become misfolded, and then it would then propagate. And these misfolded prion proteins would then cause havoc in your nervous system and then leads to um, your brain to look like a sponge, um, which is where, why BSE is called bovine spongiform encephalitis. Encephalopathy. 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 Okay, thanks, Ori. Um, so that's how prion proteins spread. Um, and for a while, people didn't think alpha-synuclein, didn't realize alpha-synuclein can also be uh, spread a bit like this. But uh, several lines of evidence now suggest that alpha-synuclein also can spread a bit like a prion-like protein. So, so what, you should say that there are idiopathic TSEs caused by prions. You don't have to ingest it. It can just misfold spontaneously, right? So... Is that the case also with Parkinson's? It just starts misfolding in the brain, doesn't have to go through the stomach, although there are roots through the stomach? So I, I don't think that anyone has, I don't think that in this case, uh, anyone has suggested that we're ingesting alpha-synuclein uh, pathogenic entities, whatever whatever we want to consider them. I think that the idea, and then I think Tim will talk about, it, is that there's actually the first misfolding that occurs in the body occurs in the enteric nervous system in the gut. Okay. And then that misfolded protein is hypothesized to like spread to uh, template misfolding, for example, in the vagus, in the DMV, and then more rostrally towards mm. the cortex. So it's not that we're truly yeah, ingesting yeah. anything like with with a pri like with a um bo like a BSE case. And the, and the mechanism is not prion like really. I mean, yeah. as in that it's a protein protein interaction that then okay. causes this irreversible misfolded protein. Uh, to to propagate itself. Here, it's more that there's seeding, and you'll get to this where, if a if the protein is misfolded and it gets transferred up into the central nervous system, it somehow seeds uh, aggregation. But it's not probably not the same exact prion-like mechanism. Yeah, and the uh, I think that the idea arises not not just from the fact that early symptoms happen in the gut. But the fact that if you look at the Brock stages, the different stages have um, Lewy body pathology in areas that are actually synaptically connected. So if you look at an early stage, there's localized pathology in the brainstem, for example, in the DMV. And then as it spreads to the cortex, you can actually trace along synaptic connections two different brain regions where the pathology progresses to. And that suggests that there's kind of neuronal connections that are maybe somehow uh, mediating spread of a, a temp an aggregate that can then template aggregation in the downstream cell. And I mean, I think that we're all waving our hands here because there's, I mean, it's pretty hard to show that in, in, in vivo. Yeah, Except that's right. until this paper. All right, so let's get to the paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, before we get to the paper though, I should, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I will promise I'll get there very soon, but we should talk about how they, in this paper, what they're going to do, actually, we'll get to the paper, but in this paper, what they're going to do is they're going to inject a um, misfolded form of alpha synuclein inside the gut to trigger the seeding and try to see it spread throughout the brain um, in a mouse model. Um, but I'll quickly talk about how they generate this initial, because that's part of what Vincent was asking, is how do you get this initial misfolded alpha synuclein? And what they did in this paper is actually a little bit wor <laughs> scary and worrisome, is that they just purified normal monomeric alpha-synuclein and then leave it in a te test tube with a bit of stirring at 37 Celsius body temperature for a week. And after that, you see these misfolded uh, fibrils form. So they're like long ch chain of alpha-synuclein fibers. Um, and that's it. You don't have to do anything fancy. You just le let it st sit for a week. Um, and at the end, uh, after that, what the researchers did was to sonicate it to break up these long fi f uh, fibrils, fibrils? I don't know how to say it. Uh, fibrils. Sonicate it to break it up. Um, and presumably, once you break it up, you have more surface area to template and seed more kind of pathological um, alpha nuclein species. And this starting agent is what they call the preformed fibrils. So just to give some a brief background on this. So this, this kind of idea was initially uh, shown by a researcher named Virginia Lee at, at um, UPenn. 
Um, and in her case, she actually did it slightly differently, um, where she took essentially extracts from human postmortem tissue um, that and essentially isolated alpha synuclein fibril non non monomers, so what multiple aggregate or multimers of alpha synuclein, and then injected into the mouse brain, and she showed essentially that she could template aggregation downstream in other structures of the brain outside of where she injected this. So. I just I want to caution us with this paper because they've actually they're using uh, alpha synuclein which is expressed in bacteria and then they form the fibril in in vitro and then sonicate it and uh, you know what is the relationship with any pathogenic protein um, that we would see in in the human setting is hard to know. And I think there are certainly structural similarities. But the second point, and we'll talk about this, I think a little bit later is, is it just that this is a really toxic thing that someone has made in a tube and it could, you know, it has nothing to do with the human, with the human disease state. And I, th I think we don't know that yet. So go ahead. Sorry. That's my, I'll, yeah, get, off my, actually I'll, I'll get off my high horse. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. No, that, that's a really good point, though, because this, in effect, is quite an artificially derived uh, seeding. Like the initial seed in this system is quite artificially derived. Right. And but it seems to trigger uh, an outcome that looks a bit like Parkinson's. Look and just to, like Parkinson's. just to emphasize how like important this point is, is that if you, so Virginia Lee has published, you know, in the last 10 years, many, many kind of um, side points about this initial paper that she did. But one of them is that. Uh, so misfolded tau is present in many different neurodegenerative diseases and it's misfolded in different ways in each disease state. And if you extract misfolded tau from brains of patients with each different disease, you can actually, and inject it into a mouse brain, you can actually create completely different phenotypes based on the way it's misfolded in the human state. So the, the kind of the fibrils that you put in that you're going to template with the way they're misfolded is super duper important to the mm. phenotype. So yes, we have a phenotype here, but how that relates to the way it's misfolded in the human brain is important and I would say unknown. Okay. And just to drive that, that point home, I mean, the this has set back this field a lot and uh, yes. certainly in Alzheimer's disease with A-beta because for the most part, you just you can just buy the peptide and then put it in a test tube. And you, so this is something that's been done in that context for many years. And it's not clear how actual physiological it is. So um, it is a good point. And, mm -hmm. and sorry, the last thing. And then much of, much of this work has come from Ted Dawson's lab in addition to Virginia Lee's lab. And the question is, you know, what I, I was once talking to someone and they were like, oh, the special sauce is there. And it's like, what does it mean that you're creating this quote unquote infectious particle in this lab, but others can't do it. And, you know, I think there's a little bit of a, a, a challenge in, in saying, okay, this is a reproducible, robust model. And I could definitely be wrong, but that, that's just something that I worry about in this situation. Hmm. All right. With all those caveats, now let's go. Okay. <laughs> wow. Dana. Now that we yeah, called everything into question, let's go, <laughs> go further into the paper. Um, what's, uh, what people have found is that what, is, what people have found is that if you sprinkle these um, artificially created, misfolded alpha synuclein uh, fibrils into a cell culture of neurons, what you, can, what you get is that these neurons start having alpha synuclein pathology uh, in that you would see start seeing Lewy bodies form in these cell culture neurons. And if you were to extract, grind up these neurons and extract the alpha synuclein and test them, the alpha synuclein uh, now has become detergent insoluble, which suggests that they're aggregating. And they're also, there's a whole pathological hallmark in that they become phosphorylated. And this phosphorylated alpha synuclein is going to be important in this paper because that's one of the biomarkers these researchers look for to show that these neurons are sick uh, with with sick alpha synuclein forms. Tim, I have um, a quick question. Sure. The experiment yes. that you just the experiment that you just mentioned in vitro um, did was it that the alpha synuclein they added to the culture? was internalized into the cell or did it somehow trigger production in the neuron? Super duper important question. Thank you, Vivian. Almost forgot they to don't, mention. Don't, neurons are not terribly good at engulfing stuff, I would bet. 
they they what is supposed to happen so what uh what research has found so one uh you can imagine neurons can endocytose things um well it's known that neurons can endocytose things what could have happened is that the neurons could have endocytose these misfolded alpha synucleins and then it is these misfolded alpha synucleins that are kind of put back into a disease state inside the neurons and causing these pathologies but what the researchers actually found uh, which is also in this paper uh, important in this paper for this paper is that if you knock out those neurons if you for those neurons if you knock out the endogenous alpha synuclein and then you sprinkle these misfolded uh, preformed fibrils onto these neurons, you don't see the pathology. And what that suggests is that you require the endogenous alpha synuclein from the neurons to potentially act as a template um, to cause all these, uh, you know, pathology. So that is consistent with a prion-like uh, um, mechanism. Um, so yeah, so. Uh, and also, as already suggested, another evidence that this is a prion-like disease is that um, uh, people like Virginia Lee and other researchers have found that if you inject uh, in vivo these preformed fibrils, uh, fibril, fibrils, got to get that right, preformed fibrils, and also um, uh, patients' brain homogenate into a single brain region, they start spreading to other brain region, which is what you expect with a prion. But the, um, the mechanisms of uptake and release are not very well de described. Actually, my lab's working on how uh, parts of this for tau and a beta and Alzheimer's. Hmm. Yeah, it's I. Yeah, I know very little about how important the actual synaptic connection is for these things. But it seems like the the, the pattern of spread suggests it is spreading along synapses. Yeah. Um, all right. So, with all that done, this paper. The first thing they decided to look for is basically they injected these preformed fibrils into the gut of a mouse um, and then asked if we looked at the brain at different time points after injection, do we see a similar spread first in the vagus nerve or the or the relay station of the vagus ner nerve, which is the DMV, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus in the in the brainstem, and then slowly progressing to the rest of the brain. Um, so that's figure one. Finally, we get to figure one, where the researchers show that that is exactly what they saw. So they used um, to in order to uh, show that there's pathology in terms of alpha synuclein, they labeled for phosphorylated alpha synuclein, which is a, a biomarker of alpha synuclein that could be in the disease state. And what they found was that um, if they injected uh, the preformed fibrils into the gut and then look at the gut like very like one month after, or very quickly after, you, you see gut that has alpha synuclein pathology. So that's a sanity check that it's doing something in the gut. But also, at one month after injection into the gut, they start seeing pathology in the brainstem in the DMV as predicted. But interesting, interestingly, only in the DMV, nowhere else in the brain. But if they were to wait three months, uh, then it starts spreading up the brainstem to the rest of the brain. So the first stop it goes to is uh, the locus aureus, uh, part of the mid of the midbrain, I think, maybe a little bit further back. Um, but by seven months uh, after injection, they start seeing it in uh, the substantia nigra in the midbrain where the dopamine neurons are. And then if they wait, uh, and, and also at the same time, they also see it in other brain areas such as the hippocampus and the amygdala, which is important for other kind of non-motor but more cognitive function. Um, which might explain the kind of late stage Parkinson's disease uh, symptoms that you see that can be more cognitive, such as dementia and also uh, some emotional changes. Um, Tim? And then, hello. Quick question. Um, sure. The, those areas that you mentioned, so like in Parkinson's disease, the part of the brain that gets impacted has a lot of dopaminergic neurons and receptors and all of that. Um, those other brain regions that you mentioned, do they have like high dopaminergic tone 
because there are other places like the prefrontal cortex where there is a lot of dopamine signaling, but is that, are those neurons going to be equally susceptible to alpha synuclein accumulation as the, you know, the uh, I, substantia I, nigra? I think for, Ori, please step in if I'm misspeaking, but I think the first stop, mainly just because how closely it is connected to the DMV, seems to be the midbrain where the dopamine neurons are. But even within the midbrain, um, there are two different, there are a cluster of different clusters of clusters of dopamine neurons, and they seem to be differently susceptible to alpha synuclein pathology, even within the midbrain, for reasons that is hotly debated, uh, as Ori would know. Um, but then the where the dopamine neurons project to, um, where they release dopamine is th- uh, brain regions that are more towards the front of the brain. And those seem to be um, kind of affected more uh, at a later stage. Um, and that's actually one of the tricks why we can use dopamine replacement to um, alleviate Parkinson's disease is that the dopamine neurons might be gone, but the brain area that they're projecting to, they are those neurons are still kind of hobbling along and can function. So you can just replace dopamine in those areas and the patient can move again. But eventually, those areas, such as the prefrontal cortex, also, I think, gets invaded by pathological alpha synuclein, and you start getting cognitive decline. So, Tim, this, they don't see this pathology with human alpha synuclein. Is that expected? You have to have perfect homology? Ah, that is something that... Uh, so, just to elaborate, um, what, uh, what Vincent said uh, was that the preformed fibrils that these researchers injected into the mice came from a uh, recombinant uh, mouse alpha mm-hmm. synuclein. So these are shaking mouse alpha synuclein in the test tube for a week, letting the f- uh, fibrils grow. When they did the same thing with human alpha synuclein and injected that into the gut, they saw very little, if any, pathology. So I don't actually know why. This, I mean, that alone suggests there's some sort of species mm-hmm. different, it's different like species prions. dependency. It's like prions. Exactly. Prions. Exactly. I remember listening to a Twitter where you Maybe guys talked about Maybe that addresses it. partially Ori's objections, you know, you're just trashing a protein and putting it in. It, the, the human protein doesn't do this. No? Right. Not just any proteins would do. It has to match yeah. something inside yeah. the mouse. I think what would have been really nice is if they, I mean, there are, I think, only like nine residues that are different between mouse and human alpha synuclein. So if you could imagine essentially mutating the human synuclein and finding the necessary <laughs> residues that, are, I mean, yeah. yeah, that would have inside been a lot. But I, on the other hand, it like, that's like these are pretty big claims, and it seems like that would have been really nice to show that there's some like how the specificity occurs. Yeah, but uh, there's another paper. So I forgot to mention one impetus, one reason to do this paper is that there's a different. There's a previously been a uh, another study where they injected preformed fibrils in self in the gut, in the olfactory bulb of the animals, and in that case they found that the spread from the olfactory bulb was a lot less than you see in Parkinson's disease. So it suggests maybe the spread is not actually from the olfactory bulb. And in that study, um, th- when they injected human uh, preformed fibrils, they also saw a lot less disease. So it suggests that the, the template matching might be quite important. Yeah, And there um, are, there are human, mice with humanized alpha-synuclein um, gene, so it would have been. It, it's also oh. would be interesting to test mm. this idea yeah. that pr- human preformed fibrils in those humanized mice actually yeah. are able to template this pathology. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, then that that should have been asked from from a yeah. reviewer. <laughs> Already should have been reviewing this. Um, anyway, yeah, that would be very nice. That would that would actually answer quite a lot of like outstanding question. Yep. Um, so getting back to the paper, the researchers found that. Quickly summarize, injecting uh, alpha-synuclein preformed fibrils, so these pathological forms of alpha-synuclein into the gut, into the stomach lining, stomach wall, sorry, um, stomach muscle. Um, it spread up the vagus nerve and then slowly invade the brain in a kind of like a, a progression that suggests it is going from synapse to synapse up the brain. And... Um, What's actually quite interesting is that in the supplements, what, how much time? We don't have much time, but I'll quickly go through this. In the supplements, uh, the reviewers actually, um, sorry, in the figure, in figure one, what we've been talking about is review, uh, the 
scientists were looking at these phosphorylated alpha synuclein, which is the biomarker that the alpha uh, alpha synucleins are sick. But in the supplements, they actually ground up different brain regions and then ran Western blot to look at whether the alpha synuclein are now detergent insoluble, because that's another hallmark of aggregated alpha synuclein is that you can't, um, you can't, they become insoluble and because they're aggregated with each other and they form clumps. Um, and they ran Western blot so that you can, you can resolve how heavy these alpha synuclein clumps are. And in a mouse that doesn't have pathology, these alpha synucleins are in the monomeric form, so they're very light. But with aggregated alpha synuclein, you start seeing repeating bands of high molecular weight, suggesting they're forming some sort of clumps. What's interesting is that if you look at different brain region inside the brain, um, these clumps start showing at different time points because of this, you know, the time-dependent spread. But the bands that you see are completely different across brain regions. So like in the DMV, in the brainstem, the clump seems to be relatively low molecular weight. But when you get to the midbrain, they start becoming high and high molecular weight. And by 10 months after injection into the stomach, the alpha synuclein pathology finally made it to the olfactory bulb. And those clumps seem to be super duper high molecular weight. So I don't know whether that, they don't comment on that in this paper. Um, but I don't know whether, I mean, like Auris mentioned about different, maybe different forms of alpha synuclein being important uh, for different diseases or different stages of disease. I don't know whether this got anything to do with it. Anyway, just a, just a curiosity. Um, so, uh, so these researchers have established, basically they uh, did their own BRAC staging, uh, but in mice, after injecting these preformed fibrils um, and show that it spreads through the brain. So the next question that the reviewers asked is that, okay, we have these alpha synuclein pathologies, but do they actually lead to the hallmark symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which is dopamine neuron degeneration and also motor dysfunction? Um, so to get at that, these, res uh, these uh, researchers labeled for a dopamine neuron marker, and they found, as, as predicted, that at exactly the time at which these alpha synuclein pathologies start showing up in the midbrain, uh, in the dopamine neurons, that's exactly when these neurons start to, uh, well, seem to be dying. So there are fewer dopaminergic markers, uh, fewer cells in the midbrain, and if you look at dopamine contents, it starts dropping off. And if you look at the area where dopamine is projecting to in the striatum, you also see these kind of reduction in dopamine markers. So it seems to... Uh, uh, seems to suggest that the alpha synuclein pathology is actually having a functional effect on these dopamine neurons, just like in Parkinson's disease. Um, one thing that is um, that they that I'm wondering is that they they didn't seem to look at actually Lewy bodies inside any of these neurons. So I've, I've, I'm not sure if these pathologies um, alpha synuclein alpha synuclein pathology pathologies actually cause Lewy body and then cause I don't uh, the think, cell death. I don't think there's any mouse model where they see Lewy body formation. So, oh, so I, there's so some, I, like I the, thought I saw some neuronal culture where they did see neuro, uh, I Lewy think bodies that, that could have been human neuron culture. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think there's any mouse model that has found like true Lewy bodies. Huh. Well, that would suggest that Lewy bodies is not necessary for, for cell death. Or yeah. Or that's a, another debate of that. The, the, these aggregates are actually protective and they're, right. well, they're, they're a protective response to the neuron. I think one of the biggest issues in mice is they just don't live long enough to accumulate the protein in, in these aggregates. So it, most of the models, even Alzheimer's, you really have to drive human expression of these proteins to high levels to get any pathology. And so I think it's, it's, it's just part of the aging process that in the end, most of these diseases, the progression is decades. Mm. Yeah, and, and right, and just to add to that, you know, all of the evidence for Lewy bodies comes from autopsy studies. So, presumably, these are ten to fifty years after the initiating trigger, right? So we don't know we don't know whether the Lewy bodies are truly pathogenic or not, hmm. or okay. they just show up later on. Okay, 
Okay. So but they, sh- but they show up really nice on like old staining techniques for uh, right, know, right, the, right. So yeah, the first one to be detected. You know? yeah. That's nice when that happens. Yeah. Um, okay. So so to to summarize, what we found so far is that uh, these pathological alpha synuclein preformed fibrils in the gut leads to spread slow spread to the brain and also leads to dopamine neuron death, just like in Parkinson's disease. So what the researchers next did, and uh, for those following along, we're now in figure three, um, and I think this paper is open access, so um, uh, listeners can follow along if if you wish to. So uh, what the researchers next did was the crux, I think, of this whole paper, which is if you think the preformed fibrils in the stomach is spreading via the vagus nerve uh, to the brain by templating alpha synuclein in these neurons and nerves to become themselves also misfolded and pathological, then you should be able to block all these pathologies by either cutting the vagus nerve so that it cannot spread physically via the vagus nerve or by getting rid of all endogenous alpha synuclein so there's nothing to template. Um, so that's what the reviewers, uh, not reviewers, the scientists next did. Um, the reviewers did nothing. Um, so what the scientists next did was they, uh, before they injected the preformed fibrils, they uh, operated on the mice uh, and did this thing called a truncovagotomy, where they, I'm guessing they, I didn't read the full details, but they just kind of cut the vagus nerve. Um, apparently it's a bad idea to do in humans, um, but mice seem to survive this and seem not to be too affected, uh, at least kind of in the behavior. Um, although I think they did lose weight after this. Um, and what they found, uh, after this, uh, vagotomy is that it prevented essentially one thing it didn't prevent was the alpha synuclein pathology inside the stomach um, because that is kind of like before uh, the, the vagotomy. So there's still pathology inside the stomach, but all subsequent pathology, so in the DMV, in the midbrain dopamine neurons, or the rest of the brain, they seem to be blocked by this uh, vagotomy, suggesting that if you just cut the highway between the stomach and the brain, you can block this. So consistent with a spread, a physical spread of this misfolded alpha synuclein. And the reviewers also looked, did the same thing. I'm oh, sorry, the reviewers also examined what happens if you knock out alpha synuclein and it also blocked all these pathologies. So again, it suggests that the templating is important and it's not just the pathological fibrils themselves kind of getting transported from the stomach up to the brain and causing disease. You need the endogenous alpha synuclein. Can I can and, I uh, can I just ask please. one question? Which is I think the question like so these are really, really nice controls. The question is instead of PBS, was should a control have been synuclein monomers or mute or a mutation in synuclein? So I think the I think that this goes back to the question of, you know, like these are made in bacteria, is there a residual mm-hmm. LPS? And in their in their methods, they they clearly demonstrate that they do everything they can to eliminate any kind of contaminants. But I think that PBS is not the right control. I think the question is, do the other like do the vagotomy and this nuclear knockout like make that a moot point? And I don't I don't have an answer to that yet. Ah, but to answer your first question, Ori, they did actually inject um, one of the controls was actually um, alpha synuclein monomers earlier. So it is earlier for yeah for earlier. But 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 then you don't if you don't see pathology, there's nothing to block. That's right? true for this for this yeah. case. But the, so like they had a control where instead of having alpha synuclein sitting on the bench top shaking for seven for seven days to form these fibrils, they just have the monomers without. Shaking. sitting around for seven days and just injected it and they, they didn't see pathology. See. So that suggests that it is something about this fibril, f- fibrils and all this shaking that's causing it. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's a good question. Like the control is important. Um, uh, but it seems like they're PPS and monomer seems to be the same. Mm. Um, so th- the next thing the, re- uh, the researchers did was to look at... Um, so now that we know the cell pathology 
in the in dopamine cells can be caused by alpha synuclein uh, uh, fibrils in the gut, and that it can be blocked by either cutting the vagus nerve or knocking out endogenous alpha synuclein. The researchers next asked, how about the effect of uh, preformed fibrils on behavior? So the first thing they tested was um, the motor function of the mice, because that is, after all, the the primary symptoms of Parkinson's disease is that you have motor deficit. So the researchers found that uh, with the group that just got the preformed fibrils in the gut, which you know we know leads to dopamine neuron uh, death, they have reduced motor function. So what they did was they gave the mouse a bunch of battery of tests, including rotor rod, and also which is a mouse has to it's. Uh, in the rotor test, a mouse has to kind of stand on a, imagine a picture like a, a rotating rod, like a, a giant log that the mouse has to run on and the log spins faster and faster. And we look at when the mouse falls off and mice with preformed fibrils injected in the gut and with, uh, with motor deficit, they fall off much faster. And this uh, deficit can be blocked by cutting the vagus nerve and also uh, knocking out alpha synuclein. And, the, re and re uh, the researchers also looked at the grip strength of the forelimb and similar pattern. Like with preformed fibrils, you get less grip strength, uh, you're weaker, uh, and everything is blocked by um, vagotomy, cutting the vagus nerve, and also alpha synuclein knockout. Um, what's somewhat interesting is that uh, in all the behavioral tests that the the researchers did that I just mentioned and will mention later on, alpha synuclein knockout had very little effect. So basically, it didn't do anything, um, which is odd because alpha synuclein, if it's important for neurotransmitter release, then why doesn't that cause a behavioral phenotype? Um, it's unknown, but interestingly, I kind of looked it up uh, in a kind of parallel case, if you knock out prion protein, so prion protein is important, it's, it's expressed in all neurons, it can cause all these uh, horrible, it can cause BSE and, and, and death. If you knock it out, the mouse also doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, deficits. So like you, the researchers have to work very hard to actually find any deficit as well. It, it so does, it's unknown. It does show that it's probably not loss of function of these uh, mm. proteins that are causing the deficits. I think in the alpha-synuclein case, there is evidence that the other synucleans can compensate. Exactly. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, is that in mice, it's possible that some of these things are not as important as it is in humans. Yeah, I think, first of all, I think something that Vincent always says, which you don't take the mouse to the opera, so it's hard to know kind of all the cognitive functions. But this, the second piece of that is that these are germline mutations, right? So we don't know what compensation is happening. And just to get at Jason's point, perhaps there is a component of loss of function later in life that that is not, you know, we're not testing that here, right? That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right, so alpha -synu so which the researchers have shown that um, the preformed fibrils in the gut can cause behavioral motor deficit and all those are also blocked by cutting the vagus nerve. Um, so the researchers then looked at other non-motor deficit. So that's figure four and five. Um, the first thing the researchers did was look at uh, uh, spatial memory since there's alpha synuclein pathology spread to the hippocampus. And they ran this test called the Morris water maze, where the mouse has to learn, uh, you put a mouse in a swimming pool where there's a hidden platform and the mouse has to learn to swim to get to the platform. Um, so it has to like, based on its uh, spatial cues of the swimming, outside the swimming pool, it has to kind of try to find where the platform is. And mice with the preformed fibrils injected into the gut did really quite badly in this test. Um, and that is completely uh, alleviated by cutting the vagus nerve or knocking out alpha synuclein. Um, and you can also look at the hippocampus and look for phosphorylase alpha synuclein, which is the alpha synuclein, patho alpha -synuclein pathology. And those are also uh, blocked by these uh, cutting the vagus nerve and also alpha synuclein knockout. So everything seems to make sense. And 
I won't get into the details. The uh, researchers did a bunch of other um, uh, uh, spatial tests and also anxiety tests to show that alpha synuclein inside the gut, uh, the preformed fibrils inside the gut can also lead to all these um, cognitive deficit that is associated with Alzheimer's. Uh, wrong disease, associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, so that's quite important because it suggests that one single trigger, one single cause, uh, which is alpha, misfolded alpha synuclein in the gut or pathological alpha synuclein in the gut can trigger all these uh, symptoms um, in a mouse. Um, and finally, uh, the researchers uh, did, let's see, oh, the researchers also covered um, anxiety tests and also depressive tests, depressive symptom tests. Um, so all these are also symptoms that people found in human uh, Parkinson's disease. And again, this is recapit recapitulated in the mouse model with a preformed fibrils in the gut, again, blocked by uh, vagotomy, cutting the vagus nerve and alpha nuclear knockout. And at the very end, the researchers got to olfactory deficit. So because olfact the olfactory board was, didn't show pathology until like very, very late, the researchers waited till nine months after the injection and show that the mice actually did show uh, olfactory uh, deficit as well uh, by this time point. So it really does show that, uh, so this paper does suggest that the uh, alpha synuclein fibrils in the gut can essentially seems to uh, rep recapitulate all the hallmarks or most of the hallmarks in human uh, Parkinson's disease. So this is, I think, one of the, would be a nice start of uh, a series of studies to you know further confirm that in human case, the gut is um, the initiating factor for alpha synuclein. Uh, and Parkinson's disease. Um, but in the discussion, the reviewers, uh, sorry, the researchers, uh, I'm going to Did you just get reviews back or something? I, I'm <laughs> waiting for a review. That's why I'm very, it's been a month. Um, that's why it's on my mind. Um, the uh, researchers actually pointed out, so Vincent's uh, asked earlier about, you know, how even if it started from the gut, where do we get the initial misfolded alpha synuclein form? And in the discussion, the researchers start talking about um, some of the potential uh, uh, causes of the initial misfolded alpha synuclein. And it's been found, for example, that um, certain uh, uh, microbiome, gut microbiome, can actually cause uh, alpha synuclein to misfold. They, certain gut microbiome can actually make protein that looks a bit like misfolded alpha synuclein, and that can trigger templating. Um, and then there are also other studies that found um, injecting of ingestion of environmental toxin, um, such as this organic pesticide that farmers sometimes use called rotenone. Um, so rotenone is uh, kind of a derived from some sort of root uh, uh, it's a root extract. That's why it's called organic pesticide. But as it happens, it can block mitochondria function by blocking complex one. And the cell becomes very unhappy. And through some stress response, it might be clogging up intracellular protein degradation. The cell itself has indigestion. Um, and the alpha synuclein can start um, is folding, and that itself can has been found that that can cause uh, templating and uh, of pathological alpha synuclein that can spread uh, from the gut back to the brain. So uh, all these can so there yeah there are more and more evidence suggesting that um, uh, Parkinson's disease can uh, be initiated inside the gut by you know all the kind of environmental exposure that we do. Uh, to ourselves just so that we can live. I think it's interesting you know, that, that um, as neuroscientists, we've sort of ignored the enteric nervous system. <laughs> the number of neurons in the gut is not trivial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't know much about what they actually do or how they function. So this, I mean, <laughs> you'd think that there'd be more impetus now to try and just look at their normal physiology. 
So, or you may be familiar with Michael Gershon, right? Was mm-hmm. been studying the enteric nervous system for for Forever. decades, right? Yeah, yeah. That he was he on- always. He always claimed that nobody paid any attention. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was uh, on Stephen Colbert's show, I think, uh, discussing it once. Oh wow! Uh, which is a very funny clip if you huh. if you want to watch. Yeah. So this is, I I'm just trying to think. You know, for prion diseases, you know, there's the kind you ingest, the BSC mad cow, but then there's the familial or sporadic where uh, it just happens. There's no infection. I don't know if we don't know that it actually begins in the gut, right? Could. Uh, and even with those uh, familial prion diseases. So that that's interesting. Yeah, uh, it seems to make sense because the gut really is, you know, one of the things that faces the outside world, as Auris mentioned in when he talked <laughs> about the, the gut uh, immune memory. Yeah. It's a, it's a series of tubes that has to face all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, so you expect kind of a lot of environmental stressor um, coming in. So, Tim, a, a point of the, <clears throat> the alpha-synuclein pathology that they see in in the gut, um, is that in the neurons? The inclusions are in the neurons or are they found in a multitude of cell types? In this I'm paper, I'm just wondering they... about like macrophage activation mm. and things like that because there's always micro and microgliosis and astrogliosis right, right, and things right. like that in the brain. And so I wonder if there's kind of a similar thing happening in the gut. So in the gut, at least in this in this paper, they showed some staining where the phosphorylated alpha synuclein, so the pathological form, was co-localizing with one of the beta tubulin. So that's a neuronal marker. So it seems like they're in neurons. Um, but as Ori mentioned earlier, there are pathological out-misfolded alpha synuclein that can exist in oligodendrocytes, and that's uh, multiple systems atrophy. And there also, there was a paper that, uh, shout out to Tong in the Kang lab who uh, showed this to me. There's a paper where they found um, if you put alpha synuclein in a dish of uh, microglial cells, those microglia cells would uptake those alpha synucleins and they would themselves get indigestion and they start forming um, these things called tunneling nano. Wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, what are they called? My, yeah, it's like tunneling, tunneling nanotubes. Tunneling nanotubes to connect these, so these microglia cells. Uh, sorry. Yeah, these microglia cells. Yeah, and that would, was an alpha synuclein. It was a recent paper. I can't remember how recent it, it was. was. Oh, okay. Well, it, maybe there's multiple papers, but the mm. one that was done recently was with a beta. Oh, the the one I'm talking about is alpha synuclein. So mm-hmm. it also exists for alpha synuclein, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. So these these aggregated proteins are obviously difficult to deal with for any cells, and they try to get rid of it in these microglia, and they pass it along, um, and the cells that are, you know choked up with um, misfolded alpha synuclein. Apparently, other microglia would know that. They need help and they give them mitochondria. Um, it's nuts. Um, but yeah, uh, so so where the so whether it's the I think I don't know whether it's known the involvement of other cells in the neuronal death in in vivo at least. Um, so whether microglia activation is also an important part of cell death is is I'm guessing up for debate. Anyway. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I hopefully covered everything. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, there's some fly. So this paper is probably not the first. Yeah, this paper is probably not the, f- is not the first uh, paper to attempt to inject uh, preformed fibrils in the gut. But in the discussion, the the researchers kind of make sure they discuss discrepancy from other studies and they have some explanations. Yeah, there's a nice table in the supplement where yeah. they compare the four studies or five studies that have done this before yeah. and show why theirs is the best. Yeah, yeah, they, they have some explanation. hand wave explanation. Thanks a lot, Tim. That was great. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed that. Very good stuff. All right, that'll do it for Twin30, microbe.tv slash twin for the show notes if you want us. Send us some questions or comments. Twin at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 5013C, so your contributions are U.S. federal tax deductible. Ori Lieberman is at UCSF. Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, guys. Uh, Tim, that was awesome. Thanks, Ori.
Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Tim. Tim Chung thanks. is at New York University. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. And thanks, everyone, for, for helping the, the, good. For the background and stuff, because I don't know, even though this is what our lab does. And Vivian Morrison is at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Last call for, for Vanderbilt, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep, last call. Then it's further south. Good luck in your move. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. That was very stimulating. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. We've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.